excited. Well, we don't get to the city very often. The funny thing is that there's so much to do in Nova Scotia that when we have time to go somewhere, it's rarely like to the city. I haven't seen it and uh, I have not been in the city for a while, so that's it. Oh my god, it really is like right here. For a sign, right? Holy Can't sh miss it. You found us! Yeah. Come on in. Set up your home base. Go explore the city without towing your trailer around. Don't mind if I do. been in that location for just over seven years. So I was originally a cook. Uh, you know, I went to cooking school uh, back home, obviously, between the age of 15 and 19. Uh, very different sort of a school process compared to here. Mm -hmm. um, and then I work in restaurants. My first job, we are doing quite a bit of charcuterie. Uh, my grandparents were doing a bit at home. Um, and then when I wanted to do you know, like I mentioned earlier, really wanting to bring something new into the industry in here. Um, so nobody was doing that at the time. So I had a bit of a foundation. So I just decided to go into that field. And then obviously once you get foundation, you go to experiment and mm -hmm. create all your own recipe and all that stuff. I uh, was working in France in the Alps at the time. Um, I was working already in France for about three years after my cooking school. And uh, I always wanted to travel and being in the food industry, it's pretty easy to go anywhere you want, really. So I applied to uh, three different jobs, including one who uh, was mentioning Canada. He wasn't saying actually exactly where. Um, anyway, I took the position and they told me I was coming to, uh, the position was in Nova Scotia. Actually at the uh, Celtic Lodge in Cape oh, Breton. Yes. Yeah. So um, I looked it up on the map because I was at Cape Breton, the only one I know that's in Brittany, <laughs> in France. So I looked it up and uh, here I was. Um, and then I immediately fell in love with the Provence. Uh, you know, beautiful Provence, kind of still pretty in touch. And still to this day, I find I, uh, you know, no mass tourists or anything like that. Um, and then I work in Halifax for a bit and uh, a bit in BC but then came back to Nova Scotia. Uh, and the idea, I always wanted to have my own business. So um, I decided to stay in here, in Halifax, and do that in Halifax, and uh, try to bring something different in the in food industry in Halifax. There are so many varieties that I've never heard of. These are all gold. Is that right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Sure enough. Try a little one of those. And then we've got all right. sheep. Oh, the vacation, yeah. I mean, Yes. This is all sheep. Uh, so the main challenge is, was basically, uh, you know, when I opened my charcuterie, because that's what we do, uh, you know, 10 years ago, it was something that wasn't actually developed at all in here. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was quite a bit of education for customers, you know, like just explaining what the term charcuterie actually meant. Um, which is basically preserving, you know, like fresh meat. I was just going to say, so. we order charcuterie pretty much everywhere we go, but I don't think I ever thought about it what the like word it actually. Would be, uh, very popular now, but it yeah. certainly probably wasn't popular like you were saying mm -hmm. a decade ago. I hadn't heard of it at the time. No, yeah. what does charcuterie mean? Basically, charcuterie is a process of preserving, of preserving, sorry, a raw protein. Well, take a raw protein and make a process to preserve it. Yeah. So in Europe, before we had all the fridges, and I mean all of us in here, you know, mm -hmm. people had to find a way because they were usually working with all animals, you know, so uh, they had to find a way to preserve the meat over time. They do dry cure. So you take a raw piece of protein, you introduce salt and spices or, you know, whatever flavor you want to add into it. This first part of the process removes humidity, about 30% into the products. Then from there, once it's cured for a certain amount of time, which pretty much every product has more or less a different time of curing, uh, you move to the drying process, which is the second stage where you remove more humidity. 
And basically, the, the sole process of removing humidity, that's what makes a product being unstable to become stable. You look at these products and you're like, that is what that is supposed to look like. How do you choose? I know, I don't. Ooh, I'm going to have to trust maple gouda. <laughs> so with the uh, European background, obviously there's a different food, food culture over there compared to here. What was the notable difference when you came here and opened this shop compared to the type of atmosphere you were used to where you come from? Uh, put, pretty much everything, actually, to be honest. Um, it's actually good to see over the year, like, uh, I think the food scene has completely changed in Halifax. You know, when I first came down to Halifax, I think it was in fall 2004, I think, or something like that. Uh, and there wasn't much, like, restaurant-wise. And, you know, even at the grocery store, it was, like, pretty basic, mm -hmm. the products you could get. Uh, so it's a whole, whole difference. Like, it's, like, day and night. But uh, I think Canada in general, and I mean, I'm kind of took for Nova Scotia and Halifax, I made a huge jump, you know, in, into that. You can get way better products, like way more varieties. Uh, lots of really good restaurants now in the city, you know, try to do different things and make the level going up a bit. Mm -hmm. and first of all, Europe's a way older country and like the food is basically part of a religion, mm -hmm. you know. Like, you know, we, everybody makes fun of French people and their baguettes, for example. <laughs> uh, so it, it's hard to compare those two things. Do you miss the Alps? Uh, I do, yeah. I miss, well, I miss them in the winter, like I miss skiing and stuff mm -hmm. like this, like we, we were talking earlier, but um, um, but I'm going to go back this winter, actually, for the nice. first time in a very long time. Our yeah. bag of goodies. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so You're much. Right. We're very excited to, I mean, I know I said we were going to get it for company, but it honestly might not make it. <laughs> Thank you so well, much. I hope you enjoy everything. We will. Yeah, Take absolutely. care. You're welcome. I'm so excited with this haul. What's that? I'm so excited for this haul. <laughs> but obviously, we have Just to get dessert. A feast. Score dip, please. Oh, that's a good choice. Yeah, we're going with a solid dozen. <laughs> Do the fried Boston. Fried Boston. Oh, yeah. What else we got here? Chocolate peanut butter pirate cookie. They have uh, chocolate. Oh my god, sugar twist. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you we so will. You look great. All right. Where are we heading? I'm gonna go check out the Fairbank Center. Sounds fancy. Mm -hmm. I don't actually know a lot about the canal. I haven't seen it with the lock, so this is interesting. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> I was like, crap, what did I do? I was like, what are you after? <laughs> I thought I left them in there. So I can't believe how smack in the middle of the city this is. <laughs> yeah, it definitely doesn't feel as urban as it is. Oh, it's gorgeous. So what are we looking at here, Richard? This is Lock 3, and Lock 3 is one of the largest things ever built on the Shubenacadie Canal. It's one of two locks that was built to negotiate the elevation change between Lake Micmac in that direction and Lake Charles over here. With Lock 3 here, depending on the water table, that's going to raise the purpose-built tugboat Avery and the barge it's towing anywhere from 3 to 4 meters. Um, up from the Micmac level to Lake Charles level. Mm. And this is standard of almost every other type of lock that you'll find anywhere in the world, from the Suez or the Panama Canal or the Rideau Canal in Ottawa, except in a much more charming miniature style. I was going to say, it feels like we were just at the um, Rideau Canal on our way back with our trailer. It feels like it's smaller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a much smaller version, but of course the whole canal system itself, which comprised nine of these locks, was built to expedite the shipping of merchandise from Halifax and Dartmouth to important communities in the Bay of Fundy. I've lived here for eight years and didn't realize we had locks here. Well, that's one of the things because um, the canal was only in operation for a decade until 1871. It was essentially a victim of its own success because a lot of the things that Avery's towing on the barges are railway lines. 
and his rail service to rural Nova Scotia improves, the canal quickly becomes obsolete. Right. Plus, the railways play dirty. Uh, and in a couple of cases, they build bridges over the canal that are situated in places that Avery's tall smokestack right. can't get under. So they have to adjust Avery. And the whole thing ends up in 1871, dissolving the whole series of lawsuits against the railways. Mm -hmm. But then for over 100 years, all of this is reclaimed by nature. Uh, but thankfully, in the 1960s, the city of Dartmouth starts buying up property all the way along the canal for future use. And then when the Canal Commission is created in the 1980s, the framework is there to turn all of this into wonderful recreational opportunities for hikers, bikers, strollers, joggers, and of course, paddlers who uh, go along the length and breadth of the canal every year. This is kind of cool. This is a man-made holding pond. Oh, okay. And this was created to make sure that there was a steady source of water mm -hmm. at all times to the lock, because obviously you find it embarrassing <laughs> if the, the water table was low enough that you couldn't fill the lock. Right. And lock three took about 90 minutes to fill. I've had schools run up on camp in the past. Well, one was just coming up behind me then. Oh, yep. they'll, they'll get you if you're not careful. <laughs> but the holding pond, as you say, was created. It was dredged out. And of course, in those days, dredging meant buckets and pails. Mm -hmm. uh, there were no heavy diggers. But during the winter, sometimes this freezes over completely. And people can skate off here. There's a couple of years ago, I think as recently as 2015, we actually walked from here halfway up to Lake Charles on the canal oh, itself. Wow. Oh, wow. And during the summer, wild uh, water at Wildwood have their uh, canoe and kayak rentals. And one of the things we're really proud about is the Canal Commission has created a number of docking facilities all the way along the canal system, so people with their own canoes and kayaks can find their way in. And we also have a disability launch over there, which is uh, new from the last couple of years as well. Yeah, we noticed so that's that really when we got nice. here. Well, we want we want everything to be as accessible as possible for people, so we get riding wheelchairs in here and all sorts of other folks coming through. Yep, that's a great idea. These are the remains of one of the very rudimentary dwellings where some of the Irish stone workers would have lived while construction was going on on this section of the canal. And from Lock 3 up to Lake Charles was an area called the Big Cut. And what that was was a narrow creek which had to be expanded to provide a navigable deep enough passage for Avery and the barge. And this was a two and a half year project and it was the most labor intensive, time consuming part of the whole project of building the canal. And they shifted hundreds of thousands of tons of bedrock out of the deep cut using everything from gunpowder, rudimentary tools, and then good old brute force. Wow. And it was easier for them to live on site when they were working on the project. And so they had these little dwellings here and they were the ultimate and open concept because they were essentially three stone walls with a roof made out of some sod thatch and some stones holding it down in place. And when this site was excavated, they discovered not one but two hearths in here. So there may have been two family units living in this small space. And they found a couple of little toys which indicate that there was at least one child living in here and maybe perhaps there was even one child born in this site during the two and a half years when it was in operation. And you really have to give the stone workers credit because of course they're here from about the 1st of April till the end of November, uh, enduring everything that the Nova Scotia climate has to toss their way. But in the 1800s, mid 1800s, it's estimated that 40% of the workforce here in Nova Scotia, either first or second generation Irish. Incredible work and yeah. in rough living conditions. Oh, very much so. Yeah, and then hard working conditions too, mm -hmm. because as I say, you do have gunpowder, which was stored in a separate building much farther away from here, obviously. Don't want gunpowder yep. in buildings near where they're burning fires for obvious reasons. But as you walk along the trails, including along here, all of this stonework, it's not naturally occurring. It's all stuff that was dredged out of the canal uh, with gunpowder and by hand. Wow. Yeah, epic undertaking. No kidding. Living on site like this, it takes me back to working oil and gas in BC. Right. And I mean, I lived out of a campsite, but it definitely wasn't quite this rough. I had electricity, so I think I had it pretty good. Steady internet connection? No. No. <laughs> no, unfortunately not. So I can commiserate with them that way. The, the workers that were here on site, it was just so much more convenient to have them here. I mean, obviously, if they weren't if they were living in the little wooden homes where they stayed during the winter, they'd have to be carting them up here back yep. and forth every day. So it's just so much easier. And of course, obviously they didn't have uh, mass transit back then to bring them here on the number 55 bus. That's it's right. It's just yeah. so close is what blows my mind. It's like literally just feet Walk from the, the door canal. Door work. Well, yeah. exactly. And as I say, the buildings themselves were, you know, there was some cots. Um, 
cooking stove, pots, that sort of type of thing, and the, you know, the showers in the restroom, or the showers you just hopped in the canal with a bar of soap, and the restrooms were somewhere off behind a tree in the woods. Yeah. So there must have been a large population of, uh, of Irish working here to have resettled in what they now call Irish Town. That's right, yeah. The, the canal went out of its way to start doing some advertising and that attracted people and of course people are also coming over here don't forget this is the time of the great famine in ireland as well mm -hmm. and so people are looking to leave that behind come to north america start a new life for themselves where they have something to eat and uh, and they really contribute just so much to the history of this province This is the big cut? That's right. It's the deep cut, and uh, the squirrels like it just as much as anyone else. <laughs> and as I say, this is where it was a two and a half year project to just shift thousands of tons of bedrock out of this site to create a navigable passage for Avery and the barge. And they tried to make sure that Avery wouldn't have too much trouble because she's a side paddle wheeler, but she was built with an almost completely flat bottom, which tried to cut down on the number of times that she might run aground going through the canal. Mm -hmm. And of course, constant dredging was part of the project of the 10 years that the canal was in operation. But as I mentioned earlier, when you're down paddling and you look up either side of the ravine, you'll get a real sense of just how much effort went into creating the deep cut. You'll also see some of the remains of the stone retaining walls that were put in to try to keep the banks from sliding down back into the canal, as they would do when you had the spring runoff and all the waters tearing down here in, in storms and, uh, mm -hmm. and rain as well. So it's, a, it's an amazing part of the whole process. And along with the Marine Railway site at the Dartmouth waterfront, it's one of the two things that really needed to be solved in a practical fashion for the canal to open at all back in 1871, or 1861 rather. That's uh, a lot for us to consider, and we get our own boat and paddle through. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Which is going to be really enjoyable. Oh, a day I can't like wait. Today, paddling through the dappled sunlight, a little waterfall on the other side of the trail, it would be just great. That's perfect. We've already seen a few people already. I'm getting jealous. <laughs> <laughs> should get our boat. Sounds good. Okay. This is so pretty. This is really nice. I had no idea this was here. Look at him, scratch him. This actually is crazy scenic around it's here. It's gorgeous. Look at these guys. Yeah. Oh, look, boats. Oh, fun. Can you go on a boat? I don't know. I would imagine. Look at the lilies, the water lilies. Oh my god, they're so pretty. Oh, so many birds. <laughs> oh, wow. So fun. <laughs> Ready? Oh, I'll jump back here. Okay, ready? Yeah. Okay. Just get ready. <laughs> ready? Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> okay. One, two, three. <laughs>
was so nice. Yeah. Perfect. Especially on the way back. We got like followed everybody there, but then they stayed there and we okay. hit back, so it was nice. Okay. I'm sure we'll be dead. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you so much. You know what the best part of all of this is? <laughs> well, it's about to happen. Well, I'm very happy to have the food, but I love leaving the trailer places, setting up home base, adventuring into the city, coming back and having our little mobile hotel set up in the middle of nature like this. It's true. It is a lot easier to maneuver than uh, having it with us all the time, for sure. You know what's crazy? What? How many places we go and we meet pe people like uh, Frederick, and there's so many great come from away stories that complement all the history that's already in this province. Oh, I know. And I like how we are getting both sides to a story. Like when we were at the Lawrence uh, House Museum learning about the shipbuilding in Maitland mm -hmm. and how important the canal was, and then we come down here and see the canal locks. Pretty cool. And that's just like the locks that we saw when we went through Ottawa. It's true. Put some truffle butter on here. What uh, cheese and meat do you want to open up? Dealer's choice. Champagne taste. Let's go with the uh, Wagyu. So please don't let me soften the finger. Yeah, careful. Oh, I've never had like fresh butter like this. Oh my God, it smells so good. <laughs> Absolutely. I love how traveling is such a great excuse to eat oh, no, all the so amazing excited. things. So true. Not to mention the donuts we'll be finishing with. Almost like one an eclectic. <laughs> meal to sit down to. It's true. Mm. So good. Mm -hmm. We're very lucky to have this in Nova Scotia. It's actually crazy to me how such a small province offers so much. What you doing in there? Well, I know you don't like to get your fingers sticky. Oh, that's So true. I got you some napkins. Oh, I got the best. And I got some utensils to cut them up. You know what I don't understand? What? Our lack of self-control. What, what are you talking about? <laughs> a Everywhere dozen, we go. What's a dozen donuts between couples? Half a dozen each. Exactly. Why limit yourself to four if you don't have to? To four. Six? How many did you say? What, what's the appropriate amount? One each would have been probably good. Not in my world. Maybe two each, because then we got something for later, too. Get off a piece of that. No, thank you. You don't want that? I'm on round donuts only. Oh. Wow. Well. Sugar high, here we go. Yeah, exactly. 